afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Bite Live 2020. Thank you so much for joining our panel discussion today in partnership with Bloom, where we'll be talking about how to boot that crisis of confidence to the curb and kickstart your career. My name is Izzy Ashton, and I'm the deputy editor of Byte at Creative Brief. I'll be hosting today's conversation alongside my amazing colleague, Nicola Kemp, who is Creative Brief's editorial director. Once you have given something a name, it is not just easier to understand, it is easier to identify with. So when it comes to things like imposter syndrome, do you need to identify with it? Is it actually helpful? What if we are inadvertently presenting women as a problem to be solved rather than a solution to the industry's collective crisis of confidence? What if the things we tell women about how they can build their creative careers are in fact holding them back? To examine and answer these questions, we have three brilliant panelists with us today who I'd just like to introduce now. First up, we have Sally Keane, who is Head of Sales at LinkedIn and Bloom Women's Network President for 2020. Sally joined LinkedIn back in 2008 when it was a startup with only 300 people globally, having previously run the commercial development team for entertainment at Yahoo. Sally is passionate about culture and inclusion and helping develop others something she is doing to brilliant effect in her role at Bloom. Alongside Sally, we have Debbie Ellison, Chief Digital Officer at Geometry UK. With over 20 years experience in technology and digital, Debbie pioneers transformational change through highly creative people-first technology solutions. A champion of inclusion and diversity, Debbie sits on WPP Roots' steering committee and Geometry's global IE&D council. She is also a campaign IPA Women of the Future. This year, Debbie joined the Empower Yahoo Finance Ethnic Minority Role Model List, has been named Industry Shaper in the Women in Marketing Global Awards, and is shortlisted as Inspirational Leader at the Ethnicity Awards. And last, but by no means least, we have Elizabeth Anyabuna, founder of Bloom in Colour, a network within Bloom representing the voices of and supporting women of colour. She is a member and mentors for Media for All, Bloom UK and Creative Access. She is co-founder of 16 by 9, a TV and video centered media planning, buying and production agency backed by Good Stuff. And she recently co-launched Black Corner, a black business directory, marketing and mentoring support platform committed to supporting and elevating black owned businesses. So thank you all so much for being with us this, today. The reality is that visibility shows us what possibilities are and more nuanced visibility, like hearing people's personal experiences, shows us the complications within that. That is why we are so grateful today to have three amazing women sharing their experiences and their advice with all of us, to acknowledge that while we might not all have the answers, we can work together to boost each other's confidence. So this afternoon, we wanna run as interactive a session as possible. So if you do have any questions, please do put them in the Q&A section at the bottom. Um, and if you're sharing your thoughts or challenges as we go, then please do share them in the chat and we will try and read out and answer as many as we possibly can. But for now, I'm gonna hand over to the lovely Nikki who will be guiding the conversation from here. Thank you so much, Izzy. And thank you to everyone for tuning in today. Um, maintaining your career and your creative energy in the midst of a global pandemic is no mean feat. From navigating the fact that you are always on mute on Zoom calls, um, to trying to read body language over video calls. If anyone knows how to do that, please tell me in the chat. To making the most of informal networking opportunities. We are all facing new challenges in our working lives. And as Izzy said, we want to make this session really interactive. So if you've got tips or comments, do add them to the chat session and Izzy will be sharing them as we go along. So to kick off, our first theme um, is really confidence how you build it, find it, and maintain it, particularly in these strange times we find us ourselves working in. So Debbie, I'd love to start with you if that's okay. And as someone who really builds off the energy of other people, um, how have you adapted and what challenges have you faced in this time? So definitely I hit a real low of confidence as, as lockdown started and I always knew that I liked being around people. As you said, Nikki, I love getting my energy from people. Um, and I knew that and I, and I put my lack of confidence down to not being around people. Um, 
but I felt that there was something more than just that, right? Like um, I felt as though I really needed to dig deep into why I was really struggling. And what I kind of realized after speaking to a lot of friends and colleagues was around, you know, how we all do, how we all are coping with lockdown. I realized that um, I'm a performer, right? I work for a global agency. Lots of what I do is not just talking and being around people. It's taking taking our clients, taking our, our people on a journey. And in order to do that, when you're in a when you're in a room, you get a lot of feedback. I think you guys kind of inferred inferred it earlier. You get a you get a lot of nonverbal feedback. So you can you can see the whites of people's eyes. You can see how they might shift when you say something. And I realised that I wasn't getting that type of feedback on Zoom. And actually, that's what was um, creating kind of my lack of confidence, right? Um, and actually whilst I've developed some coping mechanisms such as reaching out and making much more personal connections before I go into the room. So I really try and spend time with people and, and build that connection. Actually just acknowledging the fact that that's what I need in order for me to be happy, in order for me to perform, actually was just enough, I would say. I think there's lots of things, as I said, that we can do, but actually just recognizing that that's how I'm built, that's how I am, and I'm not getting that right now it was good enough for me. I think that's such um, an interesting point and thank you for sharing it because I think in this sort of second sort of phase of lockdown we're in it's really easy to sort of just not recognize what challenges we're facing or what feedback we are or aren't getting. I had a friend that was a creative that got some feedback creative feedback from via slack the other day it's like where do you put that that's quite a sort of <laughs> it's quite a challenge. And Sally, I'd love to get your view on this and your experience as a, as a leader. Like, how have you become confident and driven your confidence as an effective leader, leading in this kind of new virtual way where we don't have those like snatched opportunities on the way to and from meetings to talk to people and to sort of get that sense of how people are doing? How, how have you kind of adapted to that? Hi, everybody. Um, so, um... <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing journey, I would say. Um, I would think when we first went into lockdown, the first lockdown, not the second lockdown, first lockdown, um, I think everyone was in real shock, right, trying to navigate this new norm. And for me as a leader, I, I would say that everything I knew kind of went out the window, right, because you have to adapt in, in a virtual world. And for me, that led to a real crisis of confidence because like Debbie was just saying, I'm I'm a bit of a performer. I've never thought of myself like that. But when Debbie just said that, I was like, oh, yeah, I think I'm a bit of a performer. Um, and so I get my energy from people right? and I feed off people. That's part of who I am. That's part of my leadership brand. And that's really what I'm known for. And so I certainly suffered a, a crisis of confidence because I was thinking, how do you get that across on Zoom, right? Or whatever video conferencing you might use. Um, but how do, you, how do you be authentic and how do you show up for them every day um, and and you have to adapt, and I had to adapt quick. Um, so, for example, one of the very first things I had to figure out was how do you ensure everyone has a voice in a team meeting, right? Because what happened very quickly, and I'm sure we've all experienced this, is when you lead team meetings, the, the loudest voice in the room tends to speak all the time. And so the introverts in, in my team and the people that are not as confident, that really led to... Um, some crisis of confidence for them and so I really had to change the way that my team meeting was completely set up and and so now I, I have space for to go around the room and make sure that everybody's voice is heard in, a, in an authentic and genuine way and um, so I think you know in a, in a non-virtual world I would have picked up on those on those things straight away but obviously that's just one way we had to adapt. I think the second thing I acknowledge is that every single person's working life has changed right so whether you be the parent that is jogging the childcare, the person caring for sick relatives, or the person that's in the shared accommodation, I had somebody who was in a house share with seven people, and there, were, there was one room with one table, there was no table in their bedroom, and they were sharing that space with seven other flatmates with nowhere quiet to go, and so they were working from their bed or on the floor. And I think as a leader, it's really up to you to be empathetic to that situation and, and really listen and understand what they're going through. And, you know, you can't really do that because you have, to, unless you really listen and understand what everybody is going through. I would say that empathy is a word that's bounded around a lot, right? But in order to be empathetic, you have to be authentic. And what I mean by that is you can't pretend to care one week 
and go, oh, tell me about your family situation. Did you manage to get a desk? You know, and then the next week, ask them where their figures are, where their numbers are, without checking in on them. And, and believe me, I think some managers have adapted to this and some managers haven't. But I think you really have to be authentic and care all the time, and accept that in this situation, business is going to have to go out the window to a certain extent because you have to just make sure that everybody is okay and, and just making sure that everything is okay at home. Um, and I also just add to that, I think to be authentic as a leader, you have to show vulnerability, right? And you have to admit that you struggled or when you're struggling with something, um, because nobody is perfect. And, you know, so for, for me, when from the first lockdown, my husband is, is a teacher. And so I was dealing with childcare at home and trying to do this job and trying to do Bloom. And uh, so I was honest with my team and said that I was struggling with the situation. And by allowing that vulnerability allows them to tell you what they're struggling with, because that really, really gets built on trust. And I think you mentioned, Nikki, that it's difficult to read the room. So how can you how can you know what's really going on? Um, you need to be honest and brave as well um, by addressing sometimes the elephant in the room, right? Which is, you know, some, sometimes um, I think we, 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 as an industry, we've suffered from redundancies and furloughs and you know were pe are people worried about their jobs right and is that a question that you can ask them is that a question that you can be bold and brave and and address it because until you really do that you're never going to really build that trust and empathy as a leader and it's from from building trust and empathy that is really helps you build confidence I would say. that's such a powerful point and especially um the role of like creating that space and what you, what you're talking about is being really intentional about creating that space to have those conversations I think that's such such good advice thank you and Elizabeth um, as an entrepreneur and a business owner can you share how you've kept momentum and you've continued to grow your pipeline and also learn to read the room virtually like what advice can you share with us all Hi, hi there. Um, yes, it's certainly been a challenge uh, setting up a business. Um, I set it up just before uh, Brexit and we thought we'd got over all of that. And then COVID came in and sort of challenged us even more. So, yeah, it certainly uh, was, uh, it certainly grew hairs on our chest, that's for sure. Um, um, I think the initial bit, the, certainly the first lockdown, there was everyone, there was a sort of like a collective sort of pause, wasn't there? It was a bit like, now what uh, and, and and certainly in a level of adjustment and with that i guess perhaps a, a knocking of confidence because it's a little like literally what do we do now because we had pipeline that wasn't pipeline anymore or you know suddenly pulled you know back in our in our tracks as it were and so um there was a stage of sort of slight panic um and then it was then right okay take a deep breath now have a look around. Initially, everyone was learning everything and pivoting and all this sort of stuff. So you felt the pressure to have to pivot because everybody else was doing it. And then you were then looking at all your stuff like, well, what do I have that's different? Because, well, we need to go online because obviously 16 by 9 is a TV and video um, uh, agency. And so there was just that initial sort of reaction. Then it was then like, take a deep breath and just pause for a minute you know, um, and collect yourself. And then, yes, you know, you might have to sort of adjust, which we did, um, but, you know, um, you're adjusting to, uh, um, the adjustment isn't necessarily a negative, it's a bad thing, it's more of a development, yeah? So we dialed up uh, parts of our business that we hadn't dialed down, say production, you know, for example, that is part of what we do. We had dialed that down because we were sort of focusing a bit more, I guess, on the uh, TV um, sort of media side of things, planning and buying, and we dialed that up you know, and, and made that um, a, a big thing because of course we could produce content and put it uh, digitally and anywhere else. Um, also uh, networking was a key thing in developing pipeline, uh, physical networking. And I'm like the uh, uh, other ladies there in that um, I'm a person in the room, you know, you kind of like go with the vibe and, and all that um, and, and, and feed off of the room in a way. Um, and so um, adjusting to the virtual world of uh, networking and actually finding where the networks were um was was kind of key so again that was again another strategy but once once you got going of course then 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 you kind of like uh, uh, um joined other networks as well whether it's bloom uh, which obviously was in there before um when it was physical but again like i say sort of other networks that i'm part of too um and then um as for um sort of like you i said about sort of uh, that virtual element and being able to kind of read the virtual room 
again, the initial bit was like everyone talks at the same time. Uh, you don't remember a Zoom or anywhere else, literally everyone was talking or, or not talking at all because you didn't know when you were coming in or not. And I found that, or I do find that certainly listening, which is always the case everywhere, whether you're listening, me talking to you physically um, or in the room, is so key. Um, and then um, using the chat function, you know, and then actually the interesting thing, ironically, is the virtual side of things really does show up people's body language way more than it, I find anyway yeah. than when you're in the room. That slight nudge, that shift, that sort of, you know, you don't necessarily see that when you're in the room. So that those those signs are telling as to whether you're waffling going on and you need to sort of shut up <laughs> or whether someone's not quite comfortable or um you know whether someone is wants to talk but you can't sort of uh, get them in so it's really reading that virtual room and reading those little shifts that you wouldn't necessarily see in the in a physical room so i actually find that a bit of a benefit and um you know oh yeah like i like the girls said i i uh, you, i i call this time uh the uh, time of discovery we're discovering we're made uncomfortable we're discovering things about ourselves how we can cope in a house uh we're not being able to go out how we're coping with family all on top of you how you're coping where i'm like sally uh, my my hubby's um key worker as well um and and all of that so this is a time of discovery so it's making people uncomfortable and therefore vulnerable but it's also making people people more accessible and kind of uh, open you're finding out things about people that you would never have known because people are suddenly sharing their other i guess challenges in life and that makes us more uh, come together as, as 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 one so those i think are the things i'm pulling out to to kind of uh, uh uh as a positive within the sort of times that we're in that's really interesting sort of seeing this period uh, as a time of discovery and i yeah. love the fact that actually you're managing to get like more body language in this virtual setting and there's kind of different types of body language as well aren't there like who's on mute who's not got their video on. Like it's a whole new way to kind of explain yeah. um, how we're doing. Mm. Um, Izzy, um, could you share any of the challenges that we've had from the audience um, so far or anything that we should be addressing? Yeah, Thank sure. Um, apologies, there is some drilling that's appeared in the background. So <laughs> if you can hear that, that's <laughs> happening today. <laughs> Perfectly timed. Um, but I guess, yeah, it's sort of that challenge around connection, I think, is coming up. How sort of, I think, Nikki, you mentioned it earlier, how people are reliant on perhaps more messaging platforms to give feedback than they are picking up the phone or having a call because it's faster and it's more immediate. And I think that that can really knock your confidence, particularly if you're more junior and you're still trying to kind of build your career and work out where you fit and sort of where you progress to. If you're just getting feedback digitally rather than I don't know hearing someone's voice or seeing someone's face it can make it very difficult and you kind of lose that connection with your colleagues or your manager or, or however your, your business is kind of structured. That's such an interesting point I think sometimes like some of the messaging platforms they're not built for empathy are they it feels like quite transactional mm. and the kind of feedback you would get versus the feedback you would get sort of face to face I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah, and there was, um, there was just another one around, um, to Sally's point around sort of creating a virtual space that actually suits every personality. I think, you know, re, re, reframing the way you do your team meetings to enable everyone to feel confident to speak up, because I think to some people, a Zoom meeting is a really comfortable environment and they feel they can be off mute and they can be chipping in. For other people, it makes them feel they make some sort of lack self-confidence in a way and massively pull back in a way that they may not have done in a physical meeting. So I think, yeah, Sally, to your point about reframing meetings, I think that's that's a really important one. Thank you, Izzy. And, and one of the, the other themes that we really wanted to touch on um, that we've seen um, a lot in the midst of this crisis, and particularly now we're kind of in further into it, we started out, we thought it was a bit of a sprint. Now it's a bit of a marathon and we're, you know, some of us are running out of steam a little bit. Um, and that's that sense of overwhelm. And we can't really talk about growing our career without talking about self-care. And we know this is a challenging time for the industry. Work-related stress and mental ill health is the leading cause of sickness absence. And according to NABS, the number of calls to its advice line due to redundancy, and you know, a point raised by Sally earlier in terms of redundancy, they're up by 117%. 
So um, I think that's a real challenge because it means that people can't necessarily feel safe to articulate the challenges that they're facing because they're worried about job security. Um, and so for this next theme, please do continue to, to share um, your thoughts in the chat. Um, I can see the Q&A box as well. We will get to those Q&As um, after this um, section. So Sally, I wanted to kick off with you because last week um, at Bloomfest, um, Chris Kenner, CEO of Brand Advance, he talked about how he had introduced a maximum of 15 minutes on all across the agency Zoom calls, which was, you know, we, we that was quite a radical um, thing to do. I mean, what's your opinion on the role for leaders in ensuring that employees have the time and space to be intentional about building their careers? Um, yeah, uh, well, first of all, how good, how great is Chris? Um, if anyone hasn't come across him, um, follow him on LinkedIn. He's a, he's a fantastic leader and he, and he actually embodies all the things I just talked about, right? Honesty, empathy, and he's very authentic. Um, so I thought what he said was super interesting, right? And, and his level for him to come out and say that, he can certainly set the rules for his company. Um, so I think it's fantastic for him to come out and say and be open and honest about this. But in reality, not all leaders are like that. And uh, that's certainly not the case. I, I can't tell you the last 15 minute Zoom call I had. Um, but I think it is within all of us, right? Not just leaders and managers, but all of us as peers, as co-workers to ensure that we are setting boundaries at work not just for ourselves, but for each other and holding each other accountable, right? So cancel meetings that are not important that could be done over the phone, shorten meetings, building breaks to protect our mental health. Um, but I think in reality, something always comes up, right? That is in your blocked out time. I have time on my calendar for a walk or the gym or childcare. And because I work at a global company and also Bloom, in reality, things come up that, that needs to be overwritten. The problem is, is they get overwritten every day as I'm sure <laughs> for a lot of people on this call. Um, but in terms of things that I think I've seen that have worked lately, which might be a bit more helpful, um, rather than just moaning that it's not happening, is, um, so I'm actually on a no internal meeting fortnight, right, at work, which basically means that at the top, we've cancelled all internal meetings to let the team refocus and, and refresh. And I think this has come from recognising that the teams are burning out, as you mentioned, Nikki, right? And so making sure that you're giving the team the option um, of, of having, if they want to check in with their managers or leaders. So we've made all things um, like team meetings and one-to-ones optional. So it's up to you, they're not mandatory. And I think addressing that at a leadership level um, that you need to take stuff off the team is super important. So we're, we're, on, we're on that at the moment. Um, we also did something uh, recently, which was quite interesting, which was assigning everyone an energy buddy within the team. So we asked, we, we matched different people up with different people in the team and asked them to check in bi-weekly on how are they taking regular breaks and how are they building in, in mental health breaks and how, and how that's working. And then we've asked them to, them to feedback because if you can hold somebody else accountable, you're more likely to do it. So those are, those are a couple of things. And then I think also the last one, um, is um, making some calls non-video calls. So, you know, you can tell because people just have their have their camera switched off on Zoom. And, you know, I used to, I was just reminiscing and I was thinking about this last night, is I used to um, do run-to-ones, believe it or not, when we were in a non-virtual world. I used to do running with my, with my team on a, a slow pace, obviously, so we could talk and catch up. But mm -hmm. what's, stopping, what's stopping that from happening now, which is like, you know, going out for a walk and ensuring people are getting out and about because... Being on video calls all day is exhausting. So those are a couple of things that, that I found, but also just, it's not just down to leaders, it's down to every single one of us to protect each other's time and be accountable for it. Thank you. Thank you. Such good advice. And I love the um, thought about um, having like a break from internal meetings to give people that breathing space as well. Also, it sets a real intention as well. And Elizabeth, I'd love to bring you in here because you're super purposeful with how you use your time and how you start your day. And I think some of this is definitely to Sally's point about all of us taking responsibility for our own boundaries as well. Um, could you tell us a bit about that and how you're purposeful with your time? Yeah, hi. Yeah, so I... Um... So I, because I'm very, very mindful, as, as we all are really, of, of mental uh, well-being and how exhausting 
uh, this all is, you know, and you find yourself getting dragged into it, don't you? You know, and, the, um, and sometimes you don't even recognize the signs, it just sort of happens. And then, and then you, 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 you notice that in different ways, whether it is that you're becoming short tempered or you're, you know, just exhausted or, 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 or all of the above. And um, so what I do, to, uh, is, and of course, I can't always do this because I mean, I run my own business, right? And if someone wants a nine o'clock meeting, then I'll, I'll do it or eight o'clock or whatever, or 8 p.m. the other way. But in the morning, I certainly carve out time. I so because I drop off kids or, you know, not all the time, most. Um, I carve out time to take that walk first thing in the morning. And I, I, I go out of my way not to book a, a, a meeting in at nine or I'll, I'll, I'll book it all in, in, in the morning and then and then um, in the afternoon. I, I basically ensure that I have that time um, and I, because I've recognized that I actually really need it, you know, just to get out, you know, and um, what then happens is you have to wrestle with yourself to stop checking yeah. your phone or doing all the work or all the stuff that you normally do and actually give some time to yourself. So I guess sort of, I think I may have mentioned this to you before, but um, when we were in lockdown and we had to um, homeschool the kids and um, the first day was all just mad, main, you know, didn't have any kind of real structure and it was just absolute chaos. Um, and then um, by either the second or third uh, day, I actually had like a, a, a plan, a sort of structure where I realized, you know, English and maths had to be right at the morning. They're both primary school, so right at the morning because in the afternoon was just a non-starter. And so by the afternoon, it was sort of more sort of science and, you know, things that were a bit more interactive, quickly, whatever. And, and I front waited the week, you know, um, so that by the end of the week, Thursday, Friday was more, I guess, for fun and less of that. And I've applied that with me, you know, unless, you know, of course you can't control everything, but I basically up weight the top and front weight the week, you know, because I know that by the end of the week, as I think your average person generally is, you're, you're absolutely shattered, particularly in COVID world. So yeah, I, 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 I make sure I take the time, you know, to actually um, uh, find that space for me to go for the walk or do whatever it is that makes me happy. You know, that I kind of triggers off the, the positives. And maybe somebody might be reading, it might be a book, it might be you call a friend that absolutely makes you laugh, it might be putting on comedy, whatever. You know, something that, because everyone's different, everyone wants a walk, you know, um, it's just what makes you sort of happy, you know. Um, and um, the other thing I would uh, certainly say, and this is something I've referenced before, is it's a bit like, um, I've, I've seen this uh, ages ago, I, I sort of came across this, but, you know, when to, uh, and I, I know that I'm likening it to debt, but, but stay with me here, um, is, um, you know, when um, someone sort of talks about their debt, you know, and sort of talks about, and, and they ask, you know, the, the, the things that they need, they prioritise to, to pay, and they'll, you know, prioritise whichever pressure's on them first, whichever company sort of, you know, um, um, put pressure on them, and food tends to be at the bottom. Food is the last thing that they put down. So they put all the, you know, debtors and whatever, then they've got their bills and all this, and food comes down at the bottom. The food needs to be at the top. So your mental well-being is your food. So shift it to the top, because if you're not well mentally, you know, if you, if you put so much pressure, you will not function fully. And I'd, I'd, I'd say certainly companies and things, you know, when you're out there, create that time, ensure that that time is there for your employees, really, because they won't be, firing in all cylinders or functioning 100 percent and what they'll be doing is um sacrificing that mental well-being which is their food and putting it right at the bottom so shift it up to the top that's such a good analogy because i think sometimes particularly when everything's apparently urgent we sort of put put the things that are literally necessary on pause just to to in search of this a lifeline it's your lifeline this is this is what makes you function you know but we tend to put that to the side um yeah absolutely thank you elizabeth and and debbie energy has been like a key focus here we're, we're all kind of working out how sally does her run to ones like i can't i can't definitely can't do a run to one i mean i'm like out of breath on a walk and talk so i'm like <laughs> very impressed with that to start with but you made a really interesting point when we talked about how not every given meeting needs the same amount of energy, which I think is such an interesting point because definitely I, I get to sort of four o'clock in the afternoon and I have got like a bit of resting Zoom face, you know, that sort of fatigue and, you know, um, the point made about um, having like a real intentional way of how you manage your energy. I mean, it, it is challenging keeping your energy levels up. Um, what tips can you share? So first of all, I think Sally has 
spoken about something that I think happens to everyone or has happened to everyone in lockdown, right? Which is we all start with the best intentions. We have an hour blocked out before our day is supposed to start. We have our lunch hour blocked out and we have maybe hopefully some time blocked out at the end of the day to really try and force in these periods of, of downtime, right? And I think if you talk to any leader um, and Sally's just, I think, um, reiterated it, those times get overwritten, over, overridden. Um, and I can't remember the last time I've actually had one of my block times. I just wanna be open and authentic to everyone that's dialing in or listening to us today, right? Because we can talk about what we'd like to do and then we can talk about reality. And then I loved what um, Liz was saying around really trying to listen to a rhythm, right? Really trying to understand your energy levels and um, um, when they're at their peak and when they're at the, um, when they're at the ebb. And for me, what I do, or what I always had done, and I'm sure you guys do, is you look on a Sunday night or on a Friday night for the next week and you prep the content that you need and you make sure that you're ready. One of the things that I've learned to do is actually prep my energy alongside that, right? So I will have a number of big meetings scheduled for the week. And actually for me, I need to get in the right mindset and I know that I need to bring my A game and my energy to those sessions. Other, not as I said, all not all meetings, not all sessions are going to be created equal. As Sally mentioned earlier, some of them are going to be check-in sessions with one-to-one, -one, some members of your team, um, uh, and you want to just find out if they're okay and how they're coping. You bring a different level of energy to kind of those sessions. And then other meetings, I think this is a massive opportunity to really help your team members to step up and step into um, uh, leading those meetings and taking on some of that energy for themselves, right? So I would say kind of my coping mechanism is really to plan out the week, not just in terms of what you need to do and what you need to prepare, but actually where you need to be mentally in order for that week to be successful for you. And like Elizabeth, like that could be everything in the morning and, and less things in the afternoon. For me, it's really pinpointing what I need to bring um, um, as an from an energy perspective kind of into those sessions. Thank you. That's really good advice. And also thank you for being honest, because I think sometimes, you know, I've definitely heard that advice given of block out your calendar. And it's it's quite challenging because everybody's working in this very remote way and sometimes you know we don't always remember what people are doing or or look first even at a calendar to see that and I think it's quite it's quite important to recognize that that's not always a simple answer I got some really good advice from a, a whatsapp group I what did we, um, about sort of telling people six times you have to tell people six times for a point to get over I was like wow that's a lot of that's a whole new rule of six um but um it's something that, that is interesting. So we've got some questions that have come in on the Q&A and we're really keen um, to switch um, to the next um, section, which is really gonna be about practical advice, um, how we avoid burnout, maintain momentum and keep leveling the playing field. So I'm gonna pass over to the lovely Izzy who's gonna host the Q&A. Thank you, Nikki. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just in the Q&A box. Do feel free to add in any more um, as we go, as, as we answer them, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, this first one, I think, from Kim is, is probably going to um, impact quite a few people who are tuned in today. So the question is, how do you suggest building resilience if you're on a job hunt and in a very competitive market right now? Um, so I don't know whether, Sally, you want to jump in on this one? Yeah, I think like there's no there's no easy answer. There's no right right or wrong answer. And unfortunately, there's no with resilience. There's no um, waving a wand and, and building it. Um, I think I would say what I would say the advice that I give to many people that I give advice to is um, to just remember your worth. Right, remember your worth and rem and like go into everything knowing your worth. And I think with interviews especially, it's not just about whether they want you. You, you should be interviewing whether you want them, right? You have so much to give as an individual, not just, not just with your skills, but also as, your pers as a personality. Do you want to work for that company anyway? You know, are you asking the right questions around 
what is their objective for work policy, what is their diversity and inclusion policy, what are they doing to champion women within the organisation, you know, these are questions you should be asking in every interview, and just by asking those questions are going to help you build resilience, um, so I think it's definitely about think going to the mindset with, do I want this job? not just I need to prove everything to my to them like do you want to work there and I think that's gonna that's gonna help you build confidence and resilience for sure yeah that's such good advice actually just to just to flip that mentally that just allows you to take on a bit more control in a way um and Debbie perhaps one for you from Shavani the question is um as an introvert how can I make myself heard and being introvert I've observed people just perceive that I am not confident or a lot of times they ignore my views what can I do to be perceived as com as a confident person? So my knee jerk reaction to that question, and I think it's a really good one and one that I think we get asked quite a lot, which is just prepare, right? Like nothing, um, um, if you're prepared, if you are, um, if you understand what value, to Sally's point, if you understand what value you bring to a conversation, then that should give you a sense of confidence, right? And that that is really important. But the other thing I would say is, please be authentic, right? Don't be an introvert and try and be an extrovert, right? The world is made up of lots of different people and lots of different characteristics and all of those are valuable and valued. So what I would say is find ways of which, find ways that you can open up spaces for other people to talk and, and hopefully they'll do the same, they'll be reciprocal back to you. So, um, if you recognize that someone's being a bit quiet on a Zoom, don't automatically think that they're not interested or that they've got nothing um, valuable to say. You know, say, Izzy, you've been a bit quiet or have you got, have you got something to add here? Like uh, help create space so that everybody can talk. And I actually do think to Liz's point earlier that it's easier to do that over Zoom than it is in, in a physical space. Um, so I think it's really important also to, as I said earlier, to make those connections ideally before the meeting, right? And be like, now's the time to be super open and authentic and pull some people aside to say, you know, I find it a bit uncomfortable or I'm, I'm really struggling getting a word in edgeways. How could you help me with that? Could you create some space for me? That, those are all okay conversations to have right now. And so I would say, just please be who you are and don't fake it to make it right like but like you know it's just as endearing it's just as valued to be an introvert as it is to be an extrovert that's such important advice thanks debbie um and perhaps one that actually sort of feeds quite nicely on from that that maybe elizabeth um if you wouldn't mind answering this one is how do i get a mentor in a virtual world i know that you were sort of talking about the importance of networking but how, how do you sort of do that virtually yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I mentor uh, quite a bit actually, um, and certainly network. There, are, there are, uh, yeah, getting into into the um, there are network. Bloom has a wonderful network in there, you know, um, program um, as well as um, other networking uh, com um, sorry, uh, com um, company groups. Um, I'm part of MIFA. That's uh, another one I mentor for. Creative Access is there. Uh, Creative Equals, um, Bricks and uh, Finishing School. Um, so there are quite a lot. So, for example, this now, right, where you've got what circa about sixty odd people participants on there. Now, every single one here um, um, is a network in a way, really. Yeah. So we are panels. We're on there. We're talking now. You know, naturally, you know, lean in. You know, we're all leaning in. We're there to lean in to them potentially recommend where you can go you know um to um get a mentor if you're not quite sure um or follow you know naturally um you and and, and sort of other uh, companies as well and again the more you're active in the virtual space you don't need to be there liking all the messages all the time or having a comment to make all the time or putting a blog out there or anything like that particularly but by just by following some of these groups you know and i'm sure sally will you know certainly uh, um uh, agree with me here by following in them and seeing what they talk about you're in that world to then go oh actually I've never heard of that that group before that looks interesting I'll go in there and then before you uh, know what's happening you're beginning to see all those networking um, sort of uh, um, groups that are there so like I said Bloom's there I'm part of MIFA and there's Lowe's Dawn you know I mean there's quite a number but by going in you, you you'll begin to sort of um um, find those uh, um, uh, groups that, that potentially mentor. Now that's on the networking side. It could be that you look at your 
sort of um, a company um, and speak to your manager and ask about, you know, any potential uh, mentoring, even if they don't have a scheme, you know, I, 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 you know, I want to sort of look into sort of potentially uh, getting a mentor um, and speak to them about it, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be formal. It could doesn't even need to necessarily be. I had someone call me up last week who's not um, in my network and not uh, someone that I've worked for in the past, but I've come across her with cross paths. And she yeah, actually had the confidence to uh, call me up and say, do you mind being part of my, I'd, I'd like you to be part of my, to be a mentor for me because I want to to do this. Yeah, I was, I was absolutely fine with that. So it doesn't have to be formal mm. and mentor. We use that word, you know, sometimes and it feels like it's a formal thing. There are many uh, setups. Yeah. I can, no, see can, I just add, can I just add to that? Yeah, because I, I, I think it's really important as well. What you said, Elizabeth, is, is so important, right? Because I think sometimes the, unless you're in a structured mental program like Blooms, we put 600 people through it, right? Unless you're in a structured mental program, the word mentor is yeah. actually quite constraining. And so if I think about my own experience uh, as a, not only mentor, but as I get mentored, right? And I have many mentors, but they don't know they're my mentors. They just people that I reach out to for challenging situations where I need advice, right? And so I think sometimes putting the word mentor can put a different constraint on it. And so think about approaching people, and this is why I always give is as you said, and as we lean in and, so, and ask people for a coffee, right? A virtual coffee for 10 minutes, 15 minutes of the time to get advice. People always want to help. And so by asking for that and ask asking for it in a structured way, so not just turning up and just not having a structure to the meeting, but ask for, say, or get advice, as Elizabeth said, I want to help build my personal brand. I want to have, know how to net, network in a virtual world. I want to help find my voice in a team meeting. Can you recommend someone? And then you're going to that meeting with, with, with an idea of how to help. So don't be, don't, don't, don't use the word mentor all the time because I think sometimes it can put people off. Yeah, yeah, that's really, that's really good advice. Thank you both. Um, and maybe I think we just have time for one more and this does actually feel like quite an important one and kind of feeds into everything that we've been talking about this afternoon. Um, the question is, what do you do if you find the way you set boundaries and are authentic doesn't align with your manager's approach? Maybe they're always scheduling meetings that can be emails or sending emails outside of work hours. What would be your advice? Because I'm sure there are lots of people who are experiencing, you know, Debbie, you were talking about the importance of setting up your day and, and, and sort of building a framework around your energy. But if your manager or your leadership doesn't respect that in a way, what do you, what do you then do? For, for me, I think we have to move away from this mentality of them and us. We're all in this together, right? So if your manager is sending emails at crazy hours or over the weekend, it's because that's when they're getting to it. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's when you have to respond, right? So I, I think first off, absolutely, you know, just, just remember that we're all trying, everyone is, is trying to work this out and work to their own rhythm. I think also if it does become a problem, again, have a have an open conversation about it. Um, I remember actually sending an email to our global CEO on a Saturday morning because that's when I got to it. And she wrote back saying it'd be really great if we could all down tools over the weekend. My, and funnily enough, I felt like this huge relief that actually it's okay and that could have waited to Monday. And, and actually for those of us that can instill um, instill that rhythm with the, with the people that we're working with. I think we absolutely should do and remind ourselves to do that, right? But as I said, everyone has their own rhythm, right? People are, are dropping kids to school, picking them up, and therefore they might want to work a bit later. Um, you know, we all have stuff going on in our personal lives that means that our our day has to shift. And so I think we've got to be respectful of that for everybody, leaders uh, uh, and otherwise. But also, again, like I'm a huge fan of just, um, as Sally was saying, just have a coffee, have a 10 minute chat and just say, this isn't working for me or I'm out from 3.30 to 4.30 doing the school run. You might get some emails in the night from me. Like, please don't respond, respond when you can. But I think, you know, to quote a cliche, we all have to be kind to each other right now. Yeah, yeah, I guess that, that, yeah, and I think that point is really true. I guess the difficulty comes when the manager's expectations are, I send an email in the evening and I need you to reply because that's on my watch. So I guess, yeah, it comes down to respect fundamentally, doesn't it, in this case? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for your uh, amazing questions. I'm just going to hand back to Nikki, who's going to do a quick fire closing question. 
Thank you so much, Izzy. And I love that point as well of just kind of open conversations, because I remember like it, it seems like a lifetime ago, but right at the beginning of this pandemic, being so paranoid that anyone was going to see my kids on on Zoom calls. Like, I was absolutely paranoid about it. And, it, you know, I got an email from from a, a, a contact and it said, I've got two colleagues, you know, one's two, the other's six. They're not necessarily, you know, they're not always the best colleagues, but you may well see them. And I was just like, oh, it just sort of <laughs> those little micro things can really kind of take um, some of the stress out of it. Um, thank you all for being so honest. And, and I love the point you made, Debbie, about finding ways you can open up spaces for other people to talk um and and find and creating that space and I think that's so central to the ethos of bloom as well that creating the space I really appreciate that um but just to close um I wanted to just ask you to leave the audience with one super um sharp confidence booster to take into their virtual offices and implement um like today so Sally what would yours be Mine would be say yes to everything, even though you don't know how to do it, right? And so, like this panel, uh, my first, my inner thought was, why do they want me to be on this panel? But I think you just have to say yes to everything, even though you're never going to know how to do it. Figure it out later, but I promise you, it's always the right decision. That's great advice. Thank you. And Elizabeth, what would yours be? I would uh, certainly say that it's um, okay uh, to not be performing 100% all the time because we're human um, and to recognize your, you know, you know the, the um, things that you do well as well as the ones that you need to work on, right? Because again, we are human. So um, yeah, you know, I, I would use that and uh, basically not use other measures to measure, measure yourself really. Yeah, so certainly it's okay to, to not be okay some of the time. Thank you, that's great advice. And, and Debbie, what would yours be? Mine will be, would be continue to make personal connections. I think it's so easy to get caught in a trap of meeting after meeting, objective after objective setting, output after output. And actually just a message, how are you doing? You know, you seemed a bit flat today. Do you want to have a chat? I think makes the world of difference and actually feeds through into those meetings where you do want to have confidence and you want to have people on your side and rooting for you, even if they disagree with you. So I think that goes for the mentoring question as well. If there's somebody that you like, it's always such an honor to be asked to be a mentor, remember that. Um, so just reach out, make those personal connections wherever and whenever you can. And it's such an important time to do that. Thank you, Debbie. That's really, really good advice. Thank you so much. We are unfortunately out of time, um, but thank you for the brilliant questions and a huge thank you to Sally, Debbie and Elizabeth for taking the time today to speak so openly and honestly about their own experiences. It really does set us all up for success when we have leaders such as these willing to step up with confidence and encourage the people around them to do the same. Um, so thank you so much for all joining us today and please do share your thoughts on Twitter with the hashtag Bite Live 2020. Um, you can sign up to more sessions on the Creative Brief site as Bite Live will be running all this week. Thanks again and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.